appreciate this opportunity that you give me each week to study the Bible and share ideas with you. And we're tackling this whole theme of anxiety because I really believe that we can win the war on worry. Anxiety has its place. It comes with life, but it doesn't have to run our lives. And God has a prescription for worry. He has a solution, an antidote for anxiety, and it's in the book of Philippians. In the summer, we're dissecting it phrase by phrase. The words are about to appear on the screen. Many of you have memorized the passage. Uh, If you'd like to look at the screen for the words, you can. Let's all read it and cite it together. And I want you to sit up straight, put your shoulders back, and fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. Let's say it like we mean it. Are you ready? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for... And the peace of God will guard your... Finally, brethren, there is anything praise meditate on these things. Yes, Lord, grant that we could do just this. Would you please take the anxiety out? Replace it, Lord, with meditation on good things. We, pr- we would request this peace that passes understanding. We lift up to you all of our requests, but we do so with thanksgiving and gratitude for all the good that you have done for us. Forgive our speaker today. His sins are many. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said... You might consider adding to your summer reading a wonderful book that just came out. It's called Called for Life, authored by Kent and Amber Brantley. You may remember their story this time last year. Dr. Brantley's name was in the news. In fact, it was on Wednesday evening, July 23rd, 2014 that Dr. Brantley took a seat on his couch and he opened his journal and he needed to collect his thoughts because he had spent the day feeling the effects of an illness that he knew would either be malaria or Ebola. And he was praying for malaria. He was a medical missionary in Liberia, waging a war on the cruelest of viruses, Ebola. There was no sure cure. The epidemic was killing people by the thousands. And as much as any person in the world, Dr. Brantley knew the consequences of the disease. He had treated dozens and dozens of cases. He knew the symptoms, the soaring fevers, the severe diarrhea, the nausea. He had seen the results of the virus, and yet for the first time, he was feeling them himself. His colleagues had drawn blood and begun the test, yet it would be three days before anyone knew the results. Dr. Brantley quarantined himself in his cinder block house and he waited. His wife and family were across the ocean. His colleagues were not permitted to enter the residence. He was quite literally alone with his thoughts. And in that moment, he opened his Bible and he found a passage from the book of Hebrews and began to meditate on it. The passage reads, the promise of entering his rest still stands, so let us never give up. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Brantley called to mind the phrase, make every effort, and he circled it and decided, now that's exactly what I'm going to have to do. He kept reading. He paused in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. He wrote the verse word for word in his journal. And when he came to the word confidence, he wrote it in italics. Then he closed the journal and waited. 
The next three days brought, brought unspeakable discomfort and then brought the news that they feared he had indeed contracted Ebola. Amber, Kent's wife, was across the ocean in her hometown of Abilene, Texas. She, called, she received a call from Kent the following Saturday afternoon. When the phone rang, she stepped into her bedroom to receive it. She was actually at her parents' house, so she stepped into her former bedroom. And there, Kent went straight to the point. Over the phone, he said, the test results came back. It is positive. She began to cry, and they talked for a few moments until Kent said he was too tired to talk anymore, but he would call soon. Now it was up to Amber to process the news. She told her parents. The three sat on the edge of her bed, and they wept for several minutes. After some time, Amber excused herself, and she went outside. And she walked across a large field toward a mesquite tree that had a low-hanging branch. She sat on the branch. She tried to pray, but she, could, she found it difficult to put her concerns in words. So she began to sing hymns that she had learned as a young girl. She sang, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. That lifted her spirits, and so she sang even louder. I need thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is in vain. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Come and bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. She later wrote these words. I thought my husband was going to die. I was in pain. I was afraid. Yet through those hymns, I was able to connect with God in a meaningful way. Maybe you remember this story. Maybe you remember watching the news reports of the Brantley family unfold. Maybe you remember the decision of the caregivers to give an untested treatment to Kent because they had no other option. Maybe you remember watching his transport from Africa to Atlanta, watching him as he climbed out of the back of the van and was carefully walked into the hospital. We celebrated at the news of his improved condition and then we thank God when we heard the news that Kent was cured of Ebola. But you know what? I think we can celebrate the curing of yet another disease, a virus that is every bit as contagious and every bit as deadly, the unseen virus of anxiety. Kent and Amber were prime candidates for worry. Yet they reacted to the presence of anxiety with the same deliberate resolve that they reacted to the presence of the Ebola virus. They went on the offensive. They took control of their thoughts. Kent opened his Bible. Amber opened her heart. They pondered scriptures. They meditated on hymns. Before anxiety to, could get a hold of them, they got a hold of the anxiety and they marched it out. They did exactly what the apostle prescribed in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. If the Bible has a recommended diet for the mind, this is it. These are the green vegetables for the soul. My wife, Deanlin, likes green vegetables. I don't, but she does. And she has a list of vegetables that are good for the body. It includes things like broccoli and asparagus and lettuce. As I read over the list, I don't see anything that I think is a health food, donuts and barbecue potato chips and Oreo cookies and ice cream, but I don't ask why. I know the answer. I've heard all the slogans. What tastes good on the lips does not look good on the... How did you know that already? If you want to feel good tomorrow, then eat good today. These are principles of a healthy 
diet, but they are also principles of a healthy mind. It is good to be a picky eater. It's equally good to be a picky thinker. And the Apostle Paul sets himself up here as our thought dietitian, because just as not every food qualifies to be eaten, not every thought qualifies to be thought. It must meet a standard. And he gives us the nine standards. First of all, it must be true. It must be based on God's word. It must align itself with scripture. It must be noble. The word here means worthy of respect. Boy, that eliminates everything that's immoral or or inappropriate. It must be just. It advocates fairness to all parties involved. It must be pure. This is a call for high and lofty thoughts. It must be lovely. Lovely thoughts focus on whatever beauty can be found in any situation. It must be of good report. No need for slander or gossip. It must be of good report. It must be of good virtue. It must be praiseworthy. So we welcome any ideas that promote the best of life. High ethics, lofty goodness. We meditate on these things. And as we turn our thoughts toward these things, a wonderful thing happens. We turn our backs on their opposites. As we fill our minds with veggies, we avoid a junk food diet of deceit. Unsavory thoughts, ugly thoughts, dishonest thoughts, where you tend a rose, a thistle cannot grow. We focus our thoughts on good things so the weedy thoughts do not have room. So just as some people are picky eaters, we choose on purpose to be picky thinkers. The big idea in this passage is simply this. Meditate on good things. Meditate on good things. You want to treat anxiety? Turn your thoughts toward good things. This word in Greek, as you know, the Bible was written in, New Testament was written in Greek. This word in Greek is a great word. Look at it. Logizomai, meditate, logizomai. Do you see an English word, the roots of an English word inside that? Anyone? Logic, logic. We meditate on good things. We treat our anxiety with logical thinking, with clear thinking, with rational thinking. Easier said than done. The consequence of anxiety for many is muddled or unclear thinking, if we think at all. In July 1943, a British Army officer by the name of Lionel Wygram studied the reaction of soldiers to intense battle. He noted a predictable pattern. He said in a typical platoon of 22 men, There will be a small number who who respond in courage. There will be a small number who respond in panic. The vast number of the men will go into mental neutral. He called them sheep, bewildered sheep. They will quit thinking. He writes, every platoon can be analyzed as follows. Six men who will go anywhere, 12 sheep who will follow a short distance behind, and four to six men who do not have what it takes. Another psychologist by the name of John Leach has spent the last couple of decades studying the human response to sudden stress like airplane turbulence or or economic downfalls. According to his studies, about 10 to 20 percent of us remain cool and composed under stress. Another 10 to 15 percent freak out. But about 70 to 80 percent of us become what he calls mentally paralyzed. We stopped thinking. Well, long before this research, the Apostle Paul was calling on us to mind our minds in times in which we're anxious to be careful what we think. Our most valuable weapon against anxiety weighs 2.7 pounds, and it sits right here between our ears. This was the point of Jesus in the most famous sermon ever preached on the topic of anxiety. He begins the sermon by telling us, quite bluntly, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. And then he gives us two commands with which to fulfill the first. He says, look and consider. First of all, he says, look, look at the birds of the air. 
He invites us to go outside and just look at the ravens or, or look at the, at the cardinals, look at the birds. And when we do, we notice something. They're not grumpy. They don't frown. They don't look sleep deprived. They're not lonely. In fact, they appear just the opposite. They're quite happy. They sing. They soar. They whistle. And then Jesus says, they don't sow or gather into barns. In other words, they don't work. They don't save money. They, they, they don't get stressed out and occupations, but they look happy. And then he tells us to lower our gaze from the birds and look out over the valley. He says, consider what? The lilies. Consider the lilies. Remember, he's helping us treat anxiety. So he tells us to look at the birds and now consider the lilies. Same point. They don't look unhappy. They really are very beautiful. In fact, Jesus says even though their lifespan is short, they're here today and tomorrow they're going to be thrown into the fire. Even Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed up like one of these. He's the richest king in history. And a field of lilies is prettier than he was. The point, we disarm anxiety by looking and by considering, by thinking, by processing. We look at the birds. We look at the lilies. We don't get lost in our negative downward spiral of thoughts, nor do we get frozen in no thinking. We stop, we collect ourselves, we look at the birds, we consider the lilies. We manage anxiety by managing our thoughts. We manage anxiety by managing our thoughts. Now, maybe you wanted something that was a little more mystical, a little more supernatural, a little more angelic, maybe some heavenly visitations or chariots of fire. Maybe you thought that God treated anxiety through these supernatural visions. Paul and Jesus would tell you otherwise. The key to peace is not in the emotion you feel, but in the thoughts you think. The key to peace is not in the emotions you feel, but in the thoughts you think. Do you want to feel peace tomorrow? Then think godly thoughts today. Meditate on good things. Years, and, years ago, a renowned British pastor by the name of D. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote these words about the passage in Matthew chapter 6 that we just looked at. Faith, according to our Lord's teaching in this paragraph, is primarily thinking. And the whole trouble with a man of little faith is that he forgets to think. He allows circumstances to bludgeon him. The way to avoid that, according to our Lord, is to think, to look at the birds, to think about them, to draw your deductions, to look at the grass, at the lilies of the field, consider them. The trouble with a person of little faith is that instead of controlling his own thought, his thought is being controlled by something else. And he goes round and round in circles. This is the essence of worry. That is not thought. That is the absence of thought. That is a failure to think. Paul elsewhere said, Kent, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. There is a time in which we intentionally and deliberately set our mind on things above. That's what Kent Branley did when he was about to spend three days waiting on the results from the Ebola test, he set his mind on things above. That's what his wife Amber did when she got news of her husband's positive diagnosis. She didn't panic. It was not easy, but she did deliberate things. She took deliberate steps to set her mind on good things. I did something like this once. I, and, it, and it had to do with a little lemon and a little phrase that was written on the lemon that I had attached to the dashboard of my car. One of the most difficult days of my life happened when I was 19 years old. And I was in a town called Dalton in the state of Georgia. I had never been to Dalton. I didn't know anyone in Georgia. And I wondered what in the world had happened. I was 19 years of age. This was the summer of my first year in college. 
I found myself sleeping in the Salvation Army because it was cheap. And the night before, a person who had had too much to drink rolled over in his bunk up above mine and vomited right down on the floor. I was so homesick. If homesickness was water, I was soaked. What had I gotten myself into? Well, on the promise of some fast cash and some new sites, I had joined up with two buddies and signed on to sell books door to door. We went to sales school. My friends went home during sales school, left me to go to Georgia all by myself. I went to the field after sales school, and the first day I discovered something. People don't like door-to-door salesmen. (laughs) They don't. Not even when they're a nice kid from West Texas. That first day was terrible. Hello, I'm Max. Slam. Uh, Hello, I'm Max. Slam. Hello, I'm Max. Slam. The second day was just as bad. I didn't know if I was going to make it. I couldn't envision going through a whole summer like that. So I ended up at that diner for lunch and I ordered a hamburger and I treated my bruised ego. And as I was paying for my burger, checking out at the cash register, I noticed that to the right of the cash register, there was this display And upon this display was a collection of rubberized, magnetized truisms. The kind that you stick on a refrigerator door. Do you know what I'm talking about? Little statements. And there was one of them that was shaped like a lemon. And on that rubberized lemon, these words appeared. I bet you know what I'm about to say. When life gives you a lemon, make, make lemonade. Well, it's old, it's a shop-worn, it's corny, but I'd never heard that before. And that was exactly what I needed. That little slogan told me that my problem was not my problems, my problem was the way I was looking at my problems. And it was just enough to convince me to stay on the job. I bought that little thing and I took it out to my Plymouth duster. My Plymouth duster had a metal strip on the dashboard and I stuck that magnetized lemon on that metal strip. And every day, at least a dozen times, I would reach up and I'd rub my thumb across that. And I'd think, okay, (laughs) I I can either be miserable or I can make some lemonade. I survived the summer. That's been 40 years. Much has happened. Much has changed. But friends, this much has not. Life still gives lemons. It does. And my prospects of a miserable summer are nothing compared to the lemons that some of you have received. Just a few days ago, I found myself in a conversation with an elderly lady whose husband has been diagnosed with dementia. And she's going to have to tell him he can no longer drive. And she was telling me how she was going to have to take the car keys away. Life has given her a lemon. I found myself in a conversation with a young mom. She already has one child and now she has a newborn. And it seems like she can't remember the last time she had a good night's sleep. And she's really worried if she'll be a good parent. I had lunch not too long ago with a fella who's trying to get through a very, very difficult divorce. He underestimated the damage it would do. And he's worried about his kids. He's worried about himself. If he'll ever be happy again. Life gives lemons, doesn't it? Has life given you a lemon lately? Life gives lemons to good people. Life gives lemons to bad people. Life gives lemons to old people. Life gives lemons to young people. Life gives lemons to medical missionaries. 
Life comes with lemons, but we don't have to suck on them. This is the point of the Apostle Paul. You can read your Bible from beginning to end. You can capitalize every letter in the epistles of Paul, and you will never find a promise that says, follow Christ and you'll have no lemons. It's just not there. But there is this promise that when life gives you a lemon, God will show you how to respond to it, how to handle it. When life gives you a bucket full of anxiety, Christ will show you a way to respond to that anxiety so that that anxiety does not get to you. This is the promise that God gives, that you can cast all your cares upon him because he cares about you, that you can be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, you can make your requests known to God. Life comes with a bushel full of lemons, but if you're sucking on them, they're going to make you sour. But you can respond to them in a better way. Meditate on good things. The passage, one more time. Read it out loud with me as the words appear on the screen. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue... And if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Lord, would you grant us the same?